the mines, you could expand their lifetime if the energy consume is, is low. So there is a big advantage of that. We see a lot of difficulties for various factors. Rising cost of fuel or variability, the, the mines cannot really have long-term planning because the fuel variates quite heavily. Reliability of supply, as I, to I told you before, there's, and, and transport challenges, basically. So sometimes, well, mines are very remote. Uh, uh, there are mines, uh, remember a mine in Mongolia that's it's like over 1,000 kilometers away from the next really big city hub there. So very, very complicated to bring them diesel regularly. Obviously, as well, as I said before, for example, stealing, transportation challenges, a lot of uh, yeah, problems associated with the logistics, or even countries which you might not think, like in Algeria or Algeria or uh, diesel uh, producing countries that they don't have refineries. So they have to export crude oil to import diesel. So they, even though they're producing electricity, they produce petrol, they are not able to, to use it for generating po uh, power. Uh, there is a market opportunity for many of, uh, probably of, of you as well, might be interested in diesel hybrids. PV is reducing price, it's steadily reducing price. Now we still see price reduction and there might be still a reduction in price in the next month. So still the, the competitiveness of PV is still there. <clears throat> and obviously decreasing the fuel exposure of the consumers to, uh, to the volatility of the, uh, of the price uh, well, basically gives them in, uh, security of supply and security of uh, independence of, of variations in the market. And obviously, we are seeing now at the moment an increase in raw material costs, and they are able to compensate that with decreasing electricity prices. Additionally, it's a new, huge new market for PV, where Jensen power generation was formerly leading, like off-grid applications and weak grids, where there are uh, problems with associated with the stability of the grid and uh, a, a battery system with a combined with a PV might provide uh, resilience that, that might be good to sustain the grid. Several problems or barriers for PV are, well, obviously one of them, and I, we will see, and I'll show you real data, how variable is the PV. Um, a typical value that we use for a small, medium system size is that the PV system can vary its production about 80% within one minute. That is for larger systems. For smaller systems, uh, sorry, for smaller systems. For larger systems, it can vary as much as 40 to 50, 60% in the multi megawatt systems. But I remember, for example, a project in Puerto Rico that we did. The project was because of constraints in Puerto Rico. You know, Puerto Rico is an island facing to the Atlantic. And there was a river almost parallel. It was a channel, not a river parallel to the coast. The coast coming from the Atlantic Sea. So the solar system was parallel to the coast. Clouds obviously coming from the Atlantic Sea. So the clouds were covering a very thin strip of solar system and very large parallel to the sea very quickly. So the RAM rate requirements, the variation of the power production at the point of interconnection was extremely high in comparison to a system that will be, for example, perpendicular to, to the coast, which will be then the, solar, the clouds coming over the solar system will be then covering much slower. So there's a lot of uh, problems associated or things associated to local projects, to local peculiarities, and well, that intermittency has problems, obviously, with high power quality. So big variations in a solar system have also increased, uh, increased problems associated to the gensets. And one of the solutions is obviously the battery. Uh, using this battery storage allows us to compensate, at least partially, those variations. Another thing is the night supply. And for that, obviously, solar comes between 10 and 12 hours a day in an average per day. Uh, so uh, obviously that, has a, that is related as well with the storage of battery and feeding power into the evening. 
And I will show you later examples of this works. One of the major problems for, for hybrid system is the investment side. Typically mines things in two, three, five years. Uh, so the payback time is very short, whereas in a grid connected system, uh, when you develop a project here in Germany, you know you have 15, 20, 25 years investment side. The projects are developed, are sold a couple of times, and then ends up in the hands of, a, of, a, of an investment fund, of a, of a pension fund that owns the asset over 20 years. That does not happen in the hybrid system world. You have a customer that wants to get the, the system, is the consumer as well, and they want to get the system paid back very quickly. And that obviously, a PV system is an investment in the end, and it has a long investment time, whereas, um, whereas this, uh, this is the short mind investment side that many of the industrial customers have. And increasingly, what we are seeing is obviously the PPAs, which are the power purchase agreements, which are the an investment entity that is selling, owning the solar system and selling the electricity to the owner. This is in the meantime quite common. It happens very often in these developing countries, but you have a lot of problems associated with the commercial arrangements around that. For example, lack of regulation in these countries, I see that very often. Um, another problem is, well, establishment of local companies uh, in the countries as well, uh, complicated and risky for many investors, or obviously the securities that a commercial off-taker can give to the owner of the solar system. Because in a PPA project, a developer and a financier develop and build a project and then they own the old project, the solar system, and they sell the electricity to the off-taker. But what happens, which are the securities that that off-taker can give to the owner of the solar system are extremely relevant in terms of security, securing a minimum amount of kilowatt hours that will be buy for sure, bought for sure, or uh, giving guarantees in parental guarantees from the headquarters that they, if the company goes bankrupt they get they get uh, covered or multiple securities that have to be there to ensure that someone invests into the project. <clears throat> okay. So we are moving. Excuse me. As I was saying, we are moving for. An old business model for solar companies which use feed-in tariffs, high leverage of investment with very low interest rates, you know, like you, you get extremely low interest rates here in Europe. Uh, in a stable and transparent legal environment in, for example, in Germany, but in other European countries or Americas as well. Low risk countries and policy driven businesses with a feed-in tariff, what is typically called feed and forget, so you, you know you get connected to the system and in the moment it connects, has a 20 year security. That's perfect for a financier. There's a very clear business case, very predictable. You can simulate the output of the solar system in a grid connected system very well. There are statistic methods to calculate the forecasted PV production and with multiple techniques and different irradiation uh, analysis you can calculate with a very good degree of uh, uh, a very good degree of security how much energy in reality will be produced and now we're coming to a business model in the hybrid business model where the feeding tariffs are no longer applicable we have either the PPAs a leasing contract I have seen that also a few times in the meantime or even saving sharing meaning here that someone brings the a solar system as well as other energy saving mechanisms, and they share the savings that the customer is having as a way of a kind of a leasing, similar to a leasing, and sharing the savings of the system. Now, we don't have a legal, clear legal environment for this. Uh, financing conditions in some countries are very variable, and these are, these are classified as high-risk countries with high interest rates, 
And what happens is the investor groups that you typically had in the past for these very big projects now in the moment, they don't like it. They think it's too complicated, too risky. So new models as those, and in the meantime, others are appearing. And this is being adapted on the customers. So some customers, for example, need grid stability. Then the customer requires a battery as well. Some of them just have a utilization during daytime of the system. Then a PV system matches very well the load of the, battery, uh, of the customer. So these are the business models that are evolving more and more into this hybrid business. So we are going from here to here. A lot of questions, and as I said, most of the problems are actually not really technical problems, are really business-associated problems. These are the typical problems that, uh, or the typical questions that someone has to look when solving these types. One is the value. What is the value proposition of the project? What, for what is the value of this project? For what is this? this solar system, what is going to do for the customer. Important as well is who will be the owner of the asset, who, will be, who is building and who owns the asset on a long term. In the meantime, also important the services. As I said, if we combine the system with storage and with batteries, we can not, on, we can only, not only provide battery, uh, sorry, PV power, we can also provide, for example, uh, services where the batteries are able to take the grid management of the system. We look into always into the revenues cost, which are the revenues, the costs, the OPEX, and the financing associated with this project. Who are the stakeholders involved? Do we need to create a local company there? Do we have to, uh, which are the interests of everybody there? Uh, which is the value proposition for everybody? Which, who is earning what in a project in any case? Who are the interests? I was mentioning before, I know another project in Madagascar. <laughs> Interestingly, there were operators of the diesel generators there. Now what happens, the diesel generators, we put a solar system, and it was found out that these people were stealing diesel and selling it in the, in the petrol station. What happened for them, there was no value proposition. They lost their jobs, and they even got to jail. So, Obviously, that's obviously not one of the most important, but often happens, and I will show you later a, problem, a project in India, where the customer explicitly decided not to put a battery because he had a no long-term operator there since 30 years, and he didn't want the operator to lose his job. So he didn't want the system to be automated. Well, there is interest for everybody here. Important as well, the legal part, which are the incentives, the constraints, the challenges associated with every project, and obviously the relationships. So these are the kind of the, the topics that we always look while looking into developing microgrids and their commercial vi viability. And as I said, please bear in mind, technically, many people focus on trying to find a 100% technical solution. This is everything invented already, most of the things. There's ne nearly everything that we need. The problem is, is now to manage that. I guess you might know that. That's a typical standard uh, configuration of a project, very simplified. There's obviously much more. With a PPA, let's say, let's start here. We have a genset operator and an off-taker, an energy consumer. Let's say here is a mine. There might be an exclusivity agreement and a PPA power purchase agreement with a local company, an SP, a SPV, which is a special, special purpose vehicle. This company might be founded by a project developer and has an exclusivity agreement through this. Now, there will be a, pro, a project development and there will be an EPC that will be contracted with the project developer and an investor. The investor will invest into the SPV, which might be bought from this project developer. So this project developer builds that and sells it to him. He orders an EPC. It might happen that the project developer orders the EPC, and then when the SPV is ready, the investor buys it. So there are multiple configurations here. Typically, there is technical as consultants for the investors and for the lenders. And the bank provides here also a credit to the SPV 
for construction or provides a refinancing of the project as well. The SPB obviously holds all the permits and there is an operations and maintenance contract which might be with the EPC or outside the EPC and then providing the services for the maintenance of the solar system which is selling the electricity here to the operator. This is how typically all PPA projects are tailored. There are obviously different ways of mixing because in the course of the project, uh, the project rights might be sold several times as well. So we might see, for example, as I said, the project developers sells the project when it's ready developed. Even when it is not ready developed, this might be the SPV might be sold already. Or even when the system is operating already and there is no longer project developer and EPC, the investor might refinance the project with the bank and then sell it to a pension fund or someone else. So this might be sold a few times as well. For a large project that you're aware, a SPV might be sold in general over four or five times. So the owner of the solar system typically changes four or five times. Yes? Let me... Hey, good night. There you go. No, this... On grid and off grid systems. In the meantime, as long as the system is a little bit large than a couple of megawatts, it's like this. This is a commercial arrangement for most of the projects in the meantime. Because, I mean, I'm not speaking about a mini grid as it was spoken this morning, because these projects are typically publicly funded. They are, there are helps from the World Bank or whichever donors that might be funding the project. This might be seen eventually even here. There might be multiple investors and, and donors as well, which are not shown here. This is more when it comes to small mini grids. But whenever you want to do, and it is important to understand, this is a solar system is, I mean, a little bit idealistic, but in reality is a, an investment. And it has to be economically viable so that there is in the world a lot of people interested in invest and invest into it, get a revenue so that it, it's good. But it's good that they have a good revenue so that more and more these investments happen. <clears throat> Maybe important to say as well, the difference is in financing. Uh, the cost of financing is substantially different between the projects. Uh, and well, there are multiple ways, and you can see here, uh, obviously for very large, up to very large systems, right? But there are multiple ways of funding projects. We'll probably look into projects where there might be private donors, let's say donors or investors. There were might be government grants as well for this type of applications for mini grids. There might be even crowdfunding. There is a Berlin startup which is doing crowdfunding here for renewable mini grid projects as well. Uh, whenever the projects be become larger, there are multiple development banks interested in investment. And there, inside the development banks, there are multiple uh, ways of uh, funding such projects. So, for example, I know in Germany you have three different ways of, of handling uh, development uh, money from development banks, like the KFW. You also have the export credit agencies, which help as well reducing the cost of financing by uh, providing security to the system. And obviously you have, well, multilateral funding is something that I have not seen, to be honest, in very big projects, but equity funding is very common in, in, in projects in, uh, in microgrids. That happens very, very often. So people willing, there is a few startups coming from America, typically active in eastern coast of Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, Botswana, Zambia, South Africa, Rwanda, Uganda. They are very active. They're bringing money from, for example, equity investors from the US, several companies, and they're looking for projects to get, typically they get a double digit IRR, and that's just how they look for funding projects in the, in the microgrid store. 
And what, well, what we see here is there are multiple countries with what is simpler is when the accumulated installed capacity increases, so we see here China, China India, uh, Indonesia, I think is this one, yeah? I cannot see it very well. What we see is prob um, the, uh, the more de uh, developed is the market, the simpler it is to get access to, to funding into those things. Um, as I was men mentioning before, it is difficult to find solid off-takers that can provide a, a balance sheet, a strong balance sheet in terms of a lot of continuous revenues over multiple years that give confidence to investors to invest in a solar system that will provide electricity for them. And uh, also a very, very clear learning is many, many projects die during development due to these, those securities required. I've seen so many Finally, we received yesterday uh, a request for another project in Africa that I have been hearing over 10 years. Like 15 companies approach us, always the same project. They were sure they will build this project. I was checking my emails. This is amazing. I mean, since how many years, how often the projects come and again and again the people try. But if there is no the security, unless situation substantially change, will not be changing, right? It's, one of the learnings is do not try to reinvent the wheel with a customer just because you are a very good friend of someone of them. That, that's not, su is not sufficient for developing a microgrid. Okay, I'm going to get into a little bit into the applications and we'll get into the case studies. That is a little bit the experience that I got for developing projects in these regions. And now I'll get a little bit on the applications, what I see. You might have seen that before. That is an example. Unfortunately, the, I'm playing a PDF, so we cannot see much about the, the animation, but basically showing a mine here with some consumption, diesel generators, a powerhouse, a switchgear, taking care of the load. And you can see here, uh, eventually some grid connected or eventually nothing. There are different, what we see is multiple steps, as Lars was mentioning before, it is possible to install in a first phase solar system uh, without any real interaction into the genset. We typically say that anything where the penetration of the solar system is below 20% of the total load can be installed without, without really an interaction between the generator, the generator and the solar system. Why? I was telling you that typically the solar system might vary up to 80% in a minute, right? So if we have a, body, a system which is 20% and we get a reduction of 80% of the output within a minute, in relationship to the generator, is the change, the most sudden change is not really relevant. That's the reason why I didn't see. I have to admit that I have seen people going very high here, more than 20%, especially in India. It's interesting. Uh, the people tend to go beyond any limits, and what happens is a lot of blackouts, basically. Sometimes it's acceptable, so it's not bad in reality, as long as it has a higher degradation in the generators, because they have to ramp up and down very, very quickly. But the people might go very, very high, even more than what recommended. We, what we typically say is whenever it goes beyond 20%, we have the, in our product, it's called the full safe controller, which is the first product of this, phase, uh, the, this technology we use. We have a control system that interacts with the gensets. We measure the load. And basically, in, an, in a microgrid or in a hybrid system, we should bear in mind that the generation always is equal to the production, uh, sorry, to the consumption. So we have a load that can be barely managed on the one side. And we have to meet that. We have the generators plus the solar system. So the solar system varies all the time, but we can control it very rapidly and very good. So we can curtail the up power up. So the generators auto-regulate themselves. So the generator plus the solar have to be always equal to the, to the, to the load. And what we can also put is battery inverters for multiple applications. So we can use batteries to harmonize the production of the, diesel, uh, the PV system at the point of interconnection, 
or even to shut off the DN sets. And I will show you examples in a few minutes. Here for your reference, a number of applications that uh, we have seen in the meantime. Anything from very big utilities or independent power producers, IPPs, islands. We do a lot of islands. In the meantime, seems to be, in my view, the best business case that we can find because they really have a need. There is not, well, there is sub subsidized islands, but there is, at the moment, in my view, one of the best business cases. Heavy industries like mines, pumping. I've seen a lot in Africa, typically in Chile as well, in Brazil. Rural electrification of war, of course. Hospitals, a lot. There is projects in Haiti, in, in Argentina as well. Real estate, for example, as well. Industries, a lot as well. It's a picture, for example, is for India. Military as well. A lot of, it's very surpressive. Um, I was in January in an island in the middle of the US military place where we are doing a project for them. And every kilowatt hour, every, it's the highest price I've ever seen. The, high, the kilowatt hour cost over $1.50. Kilowatt hour, not the liter of diesel. Because you have to bring bo boats to the middle of, well, American boats, boats to the location to, to run the island, right? And this is one of these, nu these nuclear sh missile shield that the Americans built. And they have radar stations and this. So extremely expensive electricity production in Ireland, and specifically for military application. Telecom industries and remote pumps are also quite often, typically a lot in Africa and in Asia. Most, there are two types of these. Most of these are AC coupled, meaning here that we convert the power of the diesel so, uh, the diesel generates AC power through the generator, but the solar system produces with inverter AC power. But the telecom industries are typically 10 to 20 kilowatt systems, and often they are DC coupled. So the solar system feeds directly to DC, and the load works on a DC side. There are also AC size systems, but the, the little of them. Tourism as well, and a lot of that is going on in the meantime is a lot rental power. So often many countries rent diesel generators for a period of time, five years. Good example, Lebanon, for example. They have a few power ships in the coast and they generate a lot of energy through, through uh, power ships that are in the sea with 200 megawatt each and they are consuming and producing the worst waste you can find, but it's in the middle of nowhere, in water, so no regulations apply. And well, in order to reduce the dependence of rental power, this is also something that in the meantime are many people are looking into that. Um, yeah, so typically for us, as SMA Sunbelt, we look into typically projects with a few criteria like should have a significant amount of baseload gensets. We like that there is a lot of gensets, so we can offset it with solar. If there is no load, very little attractiveness. Uh, the load curve might be ideally match it with the solar. So meaning here that the night, the, the energy not, not consumed during nighttime, because then it does not make sense to use solar. You have to put a lot of batteries as well, right? There might be other more meaningful applications. We look, obviously, that it might be sufficient space, typically, ideally, over a half a megawatt in order to get meaningful financing conditions, as otherwise it will be very small, the project. And obviously, the end user might be interested. Oh, the diesel costs shall be high, other, and the end user shall have a few applications, uh, shall be interested into this. So what I'm going to do is now show you a little bit about two potential opportunities, which one is the minings, and the other is the cement factories. Um, we see here, for example, the mining, mineral price is very volatile at the moment, it's extremely high, which drives all of our component costs very high. This is also reducing their profit, and, and the power generation, which is fossil fuel based, is, is, uh, 
is, is short term is, is decided that the decision to in install something is a very short term so there are a few challenges associated with that on the cement factory we see the african cement will increase will double by 2070 which uh, that was uh, two years back uh, sorry a slide from two years um, there is a pressure from them they produce a lot of co2 emissions so there's a lot of pressure to reduce the co2 emission not through the processes but through energy generations as i said here they they have 20 or 40 percent of the total opex is only on fuel and they obviously looking for alternatives they want security and the, they are obviously risked that if they are having pressure on their operations if the electricity price increases because of the fuel cost, they will obviously have a lot of problems associated with long-term planning. So here, for example, we did an example similar to what was done this morning. We are looking into the operating mines here, for example, in Australia. And we look into the power lines. And you can see here in Australia, very interestingly, how the, the lines are always in locations, Brisbane, uh, Sydney, Canberra, Melbourne, Perth, and other than that, there is nothing. But look where are the mines. They're in the middle of nowhere, where nearly no power lines are available. And if you combine that with the solar intensity, here you see the irradiation. <coughs> and so what you can see is that they need, uh, they need power. There is no power in the mines, and they have a lot of solar. So it's an excellent business case for mines. Um, there is also, we were also looking into gas pipelines and oil pipelines. And by combining the three of them, we were seeing that some of them were on the lines. You can see how the mine development goes along the gas pipeline. So the mine generation goes along with the energy development itself. Very interesting to see that. Or look here. Gas pipeline and all mines in parallel. So we can see that there is a lot of analyzing that we saw a very, uh, over 60 uh, mines which definitely did not have any type of power generation which might have problems associated with delivery of gas or fuel of any type or any electricity and there are obviously even more mines so this we have obviously done with other countries and we came to the conclusion this is a very interesting thing a very interesting business case and obviously one, what I was saying before is that you can see here out of the total uh, fuel consumption, electricity means 30 to 35, whereas the diesel consumption for grinding or trucks or other things is substantially higher. So there are obviously challenges associated with reducing this part of the bill, but not this part of the total bill. Um, there are very good conditions for these sites and the, the interesting thing is there is a lot of PV hybrid system that can be used for all of these applications which are run by diesel generators so in, in reality more and more minings we are seeing that are going now in the meantime for PV hybrid systems so we did for example a couple of mines over here here in the I think it's no this is Queensland right I don't remember that this with, uh, when it comes to cement factory, and you can see here also something similar. Well, in reality, important is uh, uh, that through the value chain, many of those uh, of the processes for cement fa uh, manufacturing are also done with electrical energy. So many of those applications, the, the solar system, uh, apply very good to these systems. And it, what is important is, is most of the systems require between 15 to 25 megawatts of power. So uh, we see a very high opportunity. And in the meantime, there is a lot of price currently under development for cement factories because the high electricity demand of such cement factories in the, in the world. Typical size might be in the range of 10 to 15 megawatts per plant. And I'm going to show you to finalize a few case studies, so a few projects that we have done. This is the picture that Lars was showing before. This is the first megawatt system size back in 2012 that we did in a mine in South Africa, in Tambazimbi, which is a megawatt system combined, which was saving in this, sorry for this format. This is because of the PDF and not being a, an, 
a PowerPoint. It does not look very nice, but you see here, 450,000 liters of diesel per year were saved per megawatt, which is a very good amount of diesel saved on a yearly basis. You can see they were using a small mine. It's only two generators, 800kW. Uh, and they have also a small weak grid connection. And we use here the inverters you see here, the models on the back. And well, this megawatt system was connected to this with our control system. You can see here, this is a pic uh, uh, from the preparation of the system, the commissioning. So you see the load is not complete. You see here in gray, the load of the mine. Here, uh, here below the load of the diesel generators and here the solar. Obviously in an off grid or on a mini grid, the generation is always equal to the load. So the generation in this time is the solar and the diesel and the, con the load is in gray. So the sum of these two curves is equal to this one, which is properly done. And what we can see here is that the solar system, it reaches a certain penetration at midday and the control system, it limits, you know, the solar system will increase at midday, we will have higher production. But the control system is limiting the PV production to ensure that there is system stability because otherwise the diesel generator will go down and will be damaged permanently. So we have to have a control system that allows us to combine the two technologies. And you can see here during daytime, the production represents around 40%. In an average during the day, about 20% of electricity. Typically, a uh, solar diesel hybrid system without batteries produces, depending on the load profile, between 20 to 30% of the electricity on a whole day. But during daytime, the penetration is high if you count only the sun hours. Here is, for example, a project in a cotton mill in, in India as well with a one megawatt system and a diesel generator. It also has a grid connection system. Um, the interesting part here, and that's what I was explaining before. You can see here the load and here the day. And you can see here that they have a de gen uh, grid connection Sometimes they have blackouts and the generator turns on, and then they have again grid connection. And let's follow that. So basically in red is here the set point of the control value of the PV, which is basically when there is grid connection, the PV is unlimited. It can be fed as much as you want because you can sell the electricity to the grid as well. Now, the solar system starts to work and there is no limitation. You see the PV set to the maximum. And then suddenly, here, blackout occurs. Grid goes away. Now, as I was saying before, ideally you can have here a battery that compensates the, a few minutes until the generator ramps up. But in reality, in this time, there was a gentleman there that his sole work during the whole day was to wait for the blackout to turn on and off the generators. So, it was decided that the generator, uh, this gentleman didn't have to lose his job, so there was no decision not to do anything. What happens after a blackout, the solar system, the control system realizes, oh, we cannot feed power, it's dangerous, so we reduce the solar system to zero. The generator in black comes in, and as you can see, the generator goes into a minimal partial load at the moment where the generator starts operating properly. And at that time, the solar system, the controller system opens the capability of the solar system and continues. So the generator goes fairly stable and the system, the solar system contributes. Now, this is the load and the load again in an off-grid system like this one is the generator plus the solar system. So this curve is this plus this. What happens is if the solar for a cloud comes in, the generator has to compensate. So that's the dip that you see here. Solar goes down, the generator comes in. In the evening, the electricity comes back, so the gentleman turns off the generator, and then again the grid comes in, so the solar system is fed into the grid again. Yeah? Here is a system that we did in Kenya, for example, one megawatt for a solar system. They have also a salt factory. We did a couple of years back. 
also quite very good electricity production in terms of 1,600 megawatt hours per year. So um, it's about 25% electricity where they're saving on a, on, a day to, uh, on a year basis. And you can see here as well the salt factory. And again, the, the load here, here the generator. You see here when there is no battery, variations in the solar irradiation has to be compensated with the generator. And then in the evening it goes down and the generator takes over. Yeah? So this is pure PVD cell as well. This is, for example, another project in Lebanon with a similar configuration on a rooftop for a factory. Here the customer decided as well to buy. So these are all, by the way, EPC projects. So the customer decided to buy the system by itself. Yeah? I will explain you a little bit more. This as well. In Lebanon, in Beirut, I think you have six hours of power, six hours of blackout, and six hours of power, six hours of blackout, and so the whole day. In the provinces, it's four hours of power, four hours of blackout. And you have to have your own diesel generator at home or whatever to turn it on and off. And these in particular, they have four hours of continuous power, and they, the grid shut off. They don't have power, basically. So. Uh, you can see here another project in Pakistan as well. You see, depending on the size of the project and the irradiation, there are different types of, uh, um, of production, uh, so a rooftop, all industrial projects. I think this project is a PPA project for this textile factory. This is a project so you see here, for example, a used factory here in uh, Marsalam, uh, no, the Marsalam, Marsalam no. This, um, again, industrial customers looking for electricity because they do not have sufficient uh, minimum system. You see all projects typically in the range of a megawatt. This is the typical size that you will find in industrial customers in your home countries. This is, for example, a resort that we did in Panama. You see here over several locations a luxury resort in an island in Panama, in Isla Bastimento. This is a smaller one. And now we're going to repower and put more for this luxury system. This is, uh, for example, a PPA project from a company coming from the US. They are selling the electricity. Why? Because it's a luxury resort having a long-term commitment. I think a night here costs like a few thousand dollars. So, well, they know for sure they will have customers and they will have a lot of money to pay for that. I think the renting one day the boat here was like $50,000, <laughs> extremely expensive. And this is in Tonga. This is a project, uh, this is a project uh, done by the uh, Asian Development Bank. So they funded this project. Um, in this project, the system is for powering the, the, the island itself. So it's a, uh, uh, it's a project funded publicly. And you see here, in this project, they have a small PV system, a little bit of batteries here, and obviously they're saving quite a lot of fuel because this is a fully isolated island. Here, for example, this is also a system. You see here inverters, batteries, PV system for a resort in Tanzania as well. Uh, one of those projects that probably was being shown this morning. You see here uh, also a few hundred kilowatts, a couple of batteries as well. And the battery is allowed. In this resort, it happens actually quite often that the people request uh, projects because the generators annoy the, you know, that you pay a few hundred dollars. You want to sleep without uh, hearing a generator in, in the middle of one of those reserves. You know, you, you, don't, you want to hear the lions and you don't want to hear the, uh, the generator producing electricity. This is a, pro a project in Madagascar that we did a couple of years back. Also, this was very interesting. I was saying before that this, uh, before this project was not done, they, it's the, last year was the only city in Madagascar that didn't have any blackout, interestingly. And until last year, they never had ice in the city because it's in the north because you have a blackout, there is no electricity, so the ice uh, melts away. So, they never had ice issues. Very nice examples how these systems can work very nicely. 
they, it's very interesting because they, well, the control system algorithm has a certain parameterization in this project in particular, and it's possible to, again, sometimes the customer go a little bit crazy. Uh, in this project, the customer shuts off sometimes the control system in a sunny day, and when the clouds are coming in, it's kicking in manually the generator. So they have, it's cheaper for them to have someone looking the whole day to the clouds, and when a cloud comes in, that shunt on another generator and override the control system that we provided them. So it's very interesting because they can live with that and it works actually. So there's not that it does not work. Ah, this is our hospital we did in, my, in Haiti as well with diesel generators and a little bit of batteries as well. Uh, it's a nice project. This one is in Bolivia, a city. It's a very big city close to Brazil, close to the Brazil border. Five megawatts of solar and two megawatts of batteries. We did a few years back in 2014. Quite interesting because the... The problem is the city is, I think it's like six, seven kilometers away from the solar system. It's on the border to Brazil. And um, well, the problem is it, it's a jungle there. So yeah, that often, yeah, like trees fell down and everything gets broken. So they have a lot of problems. And that's the reason why they install as well batteries to maintain certain stability. And we have, for example, a redundant com communication. So. The system communicates with the island, uh, sorry, with the, with the PV system by a cable and as well by microwaves to make sure that this a tree falls down, which happens very often, to communicate that. And you can see here, well, it's not animated now because of the PDF, but you can see here how it happens. You have here the load. Here is the battery. Here is discharging from zero to minus char uh, discharging, uh, charging, sorry discharge and charge. And you can see here how the solar system in yellow operates. And sometimes there are variation. In this specific case, 2.4 megawatt per minute for a 5 megawatt system. Now what happens is since the battery kicks in substantially more quick than the generator, the generator only compensates partially. And you can see here in dotted line what it will be the variation for the generation if no batteries were there, then the battery is taking basically the duty that the generator, the generator otherwise would have taken. And that helps to maintain the log load stability of the system. This is a project that we have done a couple of years back in the Caribbean, and this was the first project I showed you. Um, uh, this is a municipality, Santo Estacio, in the Antilles, in the Netherlands. There was also a project coming with uh, funding from, from the Dutch government. Um, we built here the solar system, two megawatt, with the batteries for ram rate control, so similar to this application. Ram rate control means variations of the solar system and the interconnection point can be controlled by the solar system. So this system has about two megawatts, one megawatt of battery and four megawatts of genset, which are located in the city uh, over a kilometer away from here. So we can save here with this liter over 850,000 liters. And actually, we are meeting that very well. And that's the reason why we built the second phase. But in a first phase, I want to show you what is the system you, showed this morning, you saw this morning. What is the system? without grid forming capabilities. Meaning here, the solar, the system, and the genset work together, but the generator is always there as a current so, uh, voltage source. You can see, a be, I took a very bad day, yeah? So you can see the variation in red of the solar system. Very, very bad day. Happens very often in the Caribbean, by the way, because it's an island, and when clouds come from the Pacific, at the Atlantic, you see this variation. Now, you, we can see a lot of features of what a battery can do here in a uh, hybrid system. We can see here that the battery kicks in even during nighttime to avoid the start of a second generator. So there is only one generator running and the load varies a little bit. The battery can also, as long as it is charged, act and charge and discharge to avoid that the second generator kicks in, so small variations in power. Then you see here uh, in purple is the load. It's a lot of colors, but I'm going to try to explain it. We see again the battery, let's see here in green, charge, discharge, yeah, over zero. In yellow is the load. 
in purple, we see here the generator. And we see in red the solar system. Now, when the solar comes in, again, we're in a hybrid system, isolated. Generation is equal to consumption. Load is, kicks in in the evening, a little bit more, in the morning, sorry. So the load is equal to the generator plus the solar. And you see when the, the solar comes in, the generator goes down. A lot of variations. Now, you see it's a very cloudy day here. So we have the battery all the time going up and down. What helps the generator not to ramp up and down all the time. To some point, the PV is, is doing this the PV ramp smoothing, what we call ramp rate. The generator comes to a point where it is a minimum partial load, but the generator has to be there to provide voltage and frequency regulation. And in that moment, the battery starts to get charged and shift it for the evening here. Yeah? Now, when the generator comes to here, we should bear in mind that when we have a system that has a generator, a diesel, and a battery, uh, we have to oversize the solar system to make sure that the, there is sufficient energy that, so that the battery gets charged. That's the reason why we have a difference between, oh, between the blue line, which is the real solar production, and the red line here above, which is the theoretical production of the solar system, but that we limit in order to make sure that the solar system, the system is uh, stable. So in this system, the blue line plus the purple line plus the green line is equal to this line, the yellow line. And in the evening, again, you see the solar system going down and the purple system going up. And when the, so battery, when the solar system is off, the battery, in this case, as decided by the customer, the battery shifts the rest of the energy that we charge during the day. So you can see a lot of benefits associated with a battery. The battery can shift even energy into the evening. This is a very small battery, only 500 kilowatts and a C rate of 2.5C. Now the customer decided to go further and wanted to provide with systems um, and a second phase that we com completed last year act as a voltage source. So basically, make sure that the system is able to maintain stability in the system without generators. So we are able, with more batteries and more inverters, to shut off the diesel system. And you can see here the difference between the first phase and a small battery, and now here we have more battery and more solar here on the back. So two, four, further megawatts more. Again, financed as well from donors, in this case from the Dutch government. And what you see here, battery containers, a lot of batteries here. This is lithium ion batteries. Two containers more and two inverters which are grid forming. So we combine two different types of batteries. The first phase with high speed batteries and these energy batteries. And you can see what happens here. Now, similar configuration, but you see what happens with the diesel generator. We bring it down, and you see there is much more stable than before with the battery. And now what happens? We run it at zero load, so the island runs 100% on diesel over, depending on the amount of irradiation, between eight and a half and 11 hours per day. That's the maximum that we have seen. This is with a battery with five megawatt hours. So it's a very small battery in comparison to uh, two other type of batteries still. And you can see here how the battery is charged because we have an excess of energy here. And in the evening, when the solar is not sufficient and the battery is fully discharged, then uh, it makes a final discharge and then the generator takes over. It is very interesting because now what it happens is that often in the island, during nighttime, they had also a lot of blackouts because the generator goes back. And now, since they have batteries, we have observed at least eight blackouts during nighttime that we were able as well to avoid because we have diesel, uh, but the batteries running obviously 24 hours. Also very important, that was showing last before, look how stable is the frequency now. Should be in mind, before was between 60.2 and 
So it's a substantially more stable grid than before, thanks to these battery systems. So the frequency remains very close to 60 hertz, which is the grid, island, grid frequency in the island. Okay, here a little bit about the system, and you can see how the client is able to monitor that. We've done that in the meantime in the neighboring island as well as a volcano, as you can see here, with a solar system, a megawatt here, and also battery system here. Similar, one about one megawatt, and a battery power, and now we have been awarded the second phase of this project, similar to the other island. And here, for example, a project in French Polynesia as well, about one megawatt currently being built. We are providing as well a full grid forming capabilities as in the other projects. So as you can see, this is a resort uh, in the French Polynesia. This is a resort from Barack Obama was here after he resigned from being president. He went here on holidays. So you can figure out how expensive that is as well. Um, so that is the situation. So that's the kind of applications that you have. Now, if you have any questions, yes, I'm happy to solve you, solve them. Thank you. Yes. But uh, what, is, what does this include apart from the solar and the plants and the, uh, the mm -hmm. I can answer that. So the assumption on that first slide is this meaning that there is already an existing diesel generator and this is related to the turnkey system of the PV system plus the control system. It's actually in the meantime it's substantially cheaper. Well, this is a slide that we have been multiple time, doing multiple times, depending on projects, and I took one of them as a case study that we've done, that for a specific customer. This is meant to be a turnkey price. Yes, it's very high. As I said, in the, in the moment, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1 depending on how remote is the site. It might be even very expensive. I can tell you I've seen a, a mine in Indonesia where it's a gold mine. They are bringing the diesel with an helicopter. So I can tell you that's much more than to bring diesel with an helicopter. To bring solar is very expensive as well. There are multiple software, n not so many. There are not so many software. What, what do you use? Um, well, yes, that's what I was about to show you in this. The Sunny Design can be used, and actually, you, that is what you see here. It comes out of Sunny Design. It's a platform that we use at SMA. I don't know if there was the internet here, but we'll try. This is publicly available. You only have to register. There's a software that SMA provides for free. You can register here, and you can simulate here uh, multiple projects. OK. In English. And you can create, I mean, grid connection hybrid project here. OK, now it's not open. Uh, you have to register, but here you can use. That's the simplest way. You can use PV diesel, high, uh, PV assist as a regular thing as well, but it's a grid connected system. It does not say, tell you, it just tells you the maximum theoretical system. Commonly is used in the market, Homer. And you import the host of our Yes. 
I know. It has, it has this Homer software is vastly used uh, by many, so many people sizing. It's more an economical simulation than a technical simulation, which has a lot of constraints because many people simulate and they expect that it works, but it does not. Technically, it should be always checked back what it is here proposed, right? So this is very good, though, to provide certain first simulations. And you can provide sensitivity analysis. You see here optimal system sizes for different gen sets. This is used for hybrid. And you get a levelized cost of electricity calculations. You can introduce many things. But it has specifically technical limitations. So it often comes results that do not make sense technically. We use it. And we do have, as well, a our internal in-house software program that we use for sizing what is real in real or not, specifically when it comes to batteries. Because, for example, for batteries, there is a lot of simulations required associated with the degradation of the battery and the utilization. So you can, so for example, you can see what uh, Lars was showing before. Sorry, this is not really working. Um, Last was showing before, if you remember, he had created a simple algorithm for something like that. Obviously, that we do have it for the control system, so we can, we can import weather data, and we can simulate the performance and the usage of the system. That's what we do in reality. When we simulate, we typically provide, uh, like for example, the whole containers and the batteries and the inverters to local companies, right? And one of the major challenges in a battery device system is to simulate on a second by second base the performance of the battery. Because the batteries, especially for lithium ion systems, for warranty purposes, the battery manufacturer requires a minimum amount of detail information. And the guarantee, and the, the guarantee degradation, so called performance warranty of the battery, is coupled to the usage of the battery. And what you do is you you define in your contract, in your supply contract for the battery, a performance guarantee based on a specific usage profile. And that usage profile depends on how much solar you have installed and, very important as well, how much is your load. You should be aware, I, the project in Madagascar, I think I said before as well, this project in Madagascar, this project, we received, we didn't have any load for this project we receive a load based on a diesel consumption. And what it turned out to be is that the people were still in diesel. So we, they were still in over 30% of the diesel that was consumed there. So the system has been oversized by 30% because there were no meaningful load measurements. So the people do not understand how relevant is in a con, and in, you are taking decisions. There are megawatt system size project and there is the load is based on assumptions, and it's a very bad start point. You, the best, the most important thing to clarify the feasibility of your business case is the load. And you can then tailor everything around that. But you have a bad load, but, sorry for the word, but shit in, shit out, if that's the case. I think you had a question, no? Power factor, um, typically the power factor is a 0.8 with diesel generators. So it means that you have to oversize the inverter power by 20%. That only for that. I, yeah, I mean, I don't remember that in particular now specifically. I'm not sure that it, we oversize it so much. Let me check that. I think that's maybe 300 here. It's, that's very uncommon, so it's such a system. So it's probably a three here missing. 250? So this is my friend, I can ask. <laughs> you can ask him. Very good. You have a question? Thank you. 
No, these systems are not connected to the grid, to the internet. Yes, we do have obviously different firewalls and VPN connections and different systems for protection, but they are never connected to the grid. That's No, 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 no. For a hybrid system, yes, the controller system is 25,000 euros or something like that. The controller system is 25,000 euros, uh, including all the measurement devices. So it's not, it's not the PV system. There are differences in the PV system. So as uh, Lars was saying, you typically design a solar system up to 1,000 volts. You have to size it a little bit lower in the voltage range. So you cannot put so many models in series as in a normal system, because we need about 100 to 150 to 100 volts to regulate the output. So we can curtail the solar system as I was showing, for example, here. Yeah. So we need to make sure that we do not have too many models in series. We do not get very close to the maximum system voltage, because otherwise uh, you cannot control the output of the solar system, which is important. I don't get the question. Sorry, could you please? Mm -hmm. yeah. Minimum 50,000 liters. Yeah, you have very big tanks there, and they store a lot of diesel. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. No, a month or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Or a couple of weeks. No, that, that comes very regularly. No, no. Thank you.